Some sad stories for oil exploration companies operating in Nigeria as Royal Dutch Shell, a major in that category, said that uh, its sales in Nigeria has plunged by 41% in the second quarter of the year. Shell announced a 72% drop in the second quarter earnings amidst the continued weakness in the global oil and gas prices. The oil major's liquids production available in the country was put at 37,000 barrels per day in the second quarter, down from 63,000 barrels per day in the same period of 2015. Total production by Shell uh, of, uh, we saw that uh, local subsidiary uh, stood at 128,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day down from 163,000 in the same quarter of last year. Now, a series of militant attacks in the Niger Delta targeted at oil and gas installations belonging to oil majors, including Shell, ENI, and Chevron, the Nigerian uh, National Petroleum Corporation, and Ayuto, has led to the shutdown of several fields in the country. Now, currently, Focados, Kwa Ibo, and Brass River crude oil grades are under force majeure, while Escrivos and Bonilite are facing significant loading delays. What are the implications of this uh, for a, a revenue a generation that has faced the most difficult uh, times? Nigerian government is trying to see how it can uh, rev up its revenue generation base and with the continued vandalization of uh, the pipeline, uh, that may be a difficult one for it to achieve. That Dolakoni is the head of energy research at Ecobank Group. He joins me now in the studio as we take a look at this development, as well as the latest earnings that we're getting from listed oil and gas uh, stocks in the country. Good morning, Dolakpo. Thanks for having it's me. It's good to have you in the studio. Thanks for having me. <laughs> First of all, the story of this pipeline vandalism and the impacts on oil majors. Yeah. What's your take on this? Yeah, it's a sad one, um, especially for Shell. I mean, <clears throat> if you're looking at Shell's uh, production in Nigeria some three, four years ago, Shell was the leading oil producer in the country. Um, they were pumping upwards of about 350,000 barrels per day. But since um, 2010, to be specific, um, we've seen that number decline consistently. In fact, as at 2014, when they had reached half, of what they were producing in Nigeria, about 163,000 barrels per day, they, they, they pushed out a bit of a warning that, look, we're seeing significant trouble in Nigeria and it's affecting our production massively. Number one, oh, there's a funding challenge. We, the partner we have in NMPC is not able to fund cash calls, so we're having to go and source for funds, not just for our own share of the cost, but also NMPC, and that's increasingly difficult for us, mm -hmm. um, especially as we have several other projects around the world. And then we're also seeing a security challenge. Now, in recent time, that has really escalated, and um, the 37,000 barrels per day we're seeing for a company like Shell, <coughs> excuse me, is quite a, um, quite a damning figure, uh, or I'd say a special on Nigeria as well. Um, the issue of security is very important, uh, as uh, these activities have continued unabated in the country. How do you think... Is it that it's difficult for us to secure our pipelines, really? That is the situation yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, because uh, for what we know about m the militants that seems to have been absorbed into the economy, many of them were said to have been trained to ensure that our pipelines are protected. But exactly. that seems not to be happening. Exactly. Because, it, again, it's a classic thing of uh, almost Murphy's Law. If you say something's going to go bad, it's actually going to go bad. Mm. Um, those guys were actually trained and equipped to protect the pipelines. And so they actually understand where all the pipelines are. Um, they know the vulnerable points. They know the areas they can actually hit without and have maximum impact, which is what we have seen. It, it's almost physically impossible for us to protect the pipelines. We're talking about 17,000 kilometers of pipelines in the Niger Delta. I mean, if you look at the Niger Delta, it's a series of maps here and there, of pipelines here and there. It's not physically possible for us to protect all the pipelines. But I think what we can do, which we need to do, because if you notice, what they've really targeted are our loading platforms. Mm. Um, 
key pipelines actually lead to the major pipelines, to the major platforms. Focados has been down since February. I mean, we, we can protect that better. For that, Focados is almost 400,000 barrels per day. Um, Kwaibo and Brass also are under force major as well. That's another, between them, that's roughly another 300,000 barrels per day. So roughly about 700,000 barrels per day is offline from those three alone. And then you have um, Escravos, which they, they hit the tank farm um, sometime in May, I think. Um, and so we're not able to use that tank farm until they fix that. Um, they also hit um, um, Nimbe Creek, which feeds into the Bonny um, terminal. So we're having issues with that as well. We're not able to load full capacity at Bonny, which is also another 300,000 barrel per day um, terminal. So maybe protection around the terminals need to actually increase. Those ones are onshore. Yeah. Um, so we need a combination of not just um, the military, we're talking about Navy and any other security force we can get to actually increase uh, security around those terminals and the pipelines leading to those terminals. Can we say that uh, the protection that we ought to have been getting from uh, those set of people, I just want to relate, uh, yeah. refer to them, have they withdrawn their activities, first of all, in terms of protection? Because we've seen various militant groups coming up. Yeah. We have the men, we I have mean, NDA. Is it that they have pulled back? And why did I that mean, happen? Good. You know, when the new regime came in, part of what they did was, first of all, to cancel all those contracts. Um, they canceled all those pipeline protection contracts. Okay. So, essentially, those guys were rendered jobless. Um, and part of what, that's part of what meant is also negotiating with the government currently. And I, I hear pipeline protection contracts are also being thrown up again in those discussions that mm. can, they need to bring it back. Um, it wasn't like it totally solved the problem back then as well, too. So it's not like it's going to fully solve the problem, but maybe it would reduce the speed of attacks. Maybe it will enable us at least ramp up production back to 2 million barrels per day um, and the likes of Shell back to maybe above 100,000 barrels per day. But I think one thing is different. We don't have the same amount of money to, to give away right now. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, have to be some sort of concession on the part of not just the militants, of the government, but also the militants in terms of what they're expecting the government to do for them. Okay, so this... Uh planned or ongoing conversation, negotiations that we understand is going on between yeah. the federal government and militants, will they, be, will they be successful in the wake of this uh, lack of money, lack of funds, uh, not being able to fund even capital projects in the oil and gas industry? Yeah, I think we're just going to have to find a an ingenious solution which will not involve money being thrown around because mm. there isn't that level of money are they, like, around. Are, they, are they ready so, to accept that? <laughs> that's what we don't know. That's what we don't know because, again, I mean, I was discussing with a colleague yesterday and I said this on the side that at times for the IOCs it's a bit of a difficult challenge because even they cannot take up too much protection for themselves because imagine mm. how it would sound if you hear that um, Shell security team killed 15 Nigerians who were trying to attack. Mm. It, it, it paints a bright light. So there's a bit of a softness on their own part and their willingness to also discuss. Mm. But from the militants, we haven't seen that reciprocated. So it's hard to get them to that point. That we're okay. And let's quickly take a look at earnings. Of course, this development is biting hard on the companies, and not just for those in the upstream sector of the, of, of the market, but yeah. those also playing downstream. Some earnings came in, uh, really, uh, for, from the market. MRS, for instance, says that it's our fear revenue you climbed to 53.7 billion naira yeah. from 36.9 billion naira and the, we're seeing the profit before tax that pre-tax climbing to 1.53 billion it seems to be good news for MRS for exactly. so those who are importing yeah I mean <laughs> importing it's good news for the downstream if you yes. look at all the results it's so far that we've heard we've had 40 oil we've seen MRS we've seen I think mobile as well and total and it's been fantastic um, for these guys um, and the reason is quite clear the moment the oil prices were increased um, fuel prices downstream were increased from 86 to 145 they all jumped on that bad bang immediately. I mean, mm. even if they had old stock that they had received at 86 naira per, per liter, they could sell now at 145. So there was room for them to make profit. I think what they've also enjoyed also too is that don't forget they got partnered with the upstream companies who gave them dollars so that they could also okay. import. So, some so of the them forex thing challenge was a was bit, a bit muted, addressed. a bit addressed for them. Okay. It wasn't so much, but because it's still affecting the volumes that are in the market currently. But you can see that PMS doesn't have a challenge currently. So mm. there's adequate volumes of PMS in the market, and there's enough spread on PMS, which these companies are actually reaping. Mm. Oh, so MRS actually recalling 10.2 percent yeah, in the green. A very unusual. Very, almost well, very unusual. Country, <laughs> that sometimes we don't even, we can't even see it on the table. Yeah. Again, sometimes we don't get to see how. The, how we traded in the previous day because some, for some reasons uh, investors try to stay away from yeah, it. Yeah, so it's, it's been a loss maker for a while. For so. the past two or three days it's been on the positive trend. 
Okay, Owando down 3.13%. We've seen profit warnings from some of these yeah. companies, just like we have in the banking industry as well. To what extent do you think it's going to affect investor sentiment uh, for those who perhaps will want to take some of the stocks into their portfolio? Okay, you know, part of why the downstream, well, in recent times, we've seen the downstream actually occupy some attention or receive some attention from investors. It previously it's been not very liquid, so we've not seen investor interest, but in the last two, three years, it's been quite liquid. There's been a lot of interest around the likes of Forte Oil, Total, Wando. Um, but I think right now, the downstream is attractive, and I think, mm. um, apart from the fact that valuations are pretty high already, so mm. you typically look at the likes of a Total or a Mobile, who are clear market leaders, and we also have support from the upstream businesses. Those are the ones that they sustain to obviously look at, but you also look at the likes of a Forte Oil, uh, who have also diversified into other aspects of, um, of energy, which are struggling, but still coming along a bit uh, on the way, you know. Mm. But for one, the one who's pushed out the profit warning, we know they recently also restructured, um, if I they had, but they've warned us that look, because of the FX exposure they have mm. as well, they are likely going to uh, witness some decline in their profits. So I think investors are taking that sentiment a bit serious and they're shying away. Um, but specifically for the downstream, on the, on the, on, for the oil and gas stocks on a general basis, I think. Uh, there's a bit of muted interest. It's, mm. it's not very high. It's, yeah, it's, the, it's, numbers, it's, the num numbers actually show that uh, some cautious trading, some undecided yeah. investors. I, I think that's the word, <laughs> undecided. People are like, uh, oh, it's good, it's not good. I'll just watch. Okay, so what's your outlook for the markets? Mm. Well, MRS, for instance, do you think this will be sustained, the rally we're seeing in that stock? And what the outlook mm. for other oil and gas stocks, yeah. especially on how their activities and performance on the market translate into the economy where we want to yeah. see improved activities in the, uh, uh, in the industry as a whole. Okay, just a quick one. Um, one of the things you always need to note about the downstream sector is um, second quarter is typically one of their strongest periods. And that's really because in the first quarter of the year, there's very little economic activity. We're just resuming back from holidays. Even government budget doesn't get passed most times in the first quarter of the year. But in the second quarter, most times the budget okay. gets passed and all that. So there's strong expectation. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. The expectations are high. We hope that yeah. that translates to uh, very, very good numbers at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Dolapo, Head of Energy Research at uh, Ecobank Group.